of Mice and Men, Chapter 5. One end of the great barn was piled high with new hay, and over the pile hung the four-taloned Jackson Fork suspended from its pulley. The hay came down like a mountain slope to the other end of the barn, and there was a level place as yet unfilled with the new crop. At the sides the feeding racks were visible, and between the slats the heads of horses could be seen. It was Sunday afternoon. The resting horses nibbled the remaining wisps of hay, and they stamped their feet, and they bit the wood of the mangers and rattled the halter chains. The afternoon sun sliced in through the cracks of the barn walls and lay in bright lines on the hay. There was the buzz of flies in the air, the lazy afternoon humming. From outside came the clang of horseshoes on the playing peg and the shouts of men playing, encouraging, jeering. But in the barn it was quiet and humming and lazy and warm. Only Lenny was in the barn, and Lenny sat in the hay beside a packing case under a manger in the end of the barn that had not been filled with hay. Lenny sat in the hay and looked at a little dead puppy that lay in front of him. Lenny looked at it for a long time, and then he put out his huge hand and stroked it, stroked it clear from one end to the other. And Lenny said softly to the puppy, "'Why did you got to get killed? You ain't so little as mice. I didn't bounce you hard.' He bent the pup's head up and looked in its face, and he said to it, Now maybe George ain't gonna let me tend no rabbits if he finds out you got killed. He scooped a little hollow and laid the puppy in it and covered over with the hay. Out of sight, but he continued to stare at the mound he had made. He said, This ain't no bad thing like I got to go hide in the brush. Oh no, this ain't. I'll tell George I found it dead. He unburied the puppy and inspected it, and he stroked it from ears to tail. He went on sorrowfully. But he'll know. George always knows. He'll say, you done it. Don't try to put nothing over on me. And he'll say, now just for that, you don't get to tend no rabbits. Suddenly, his anger arose. I am you, he cried. Why do you got to get killed? You ain't so little as mice. He picked up the pup and hurled it from him. He turned his back on it. He sat bent over his knees and he whispered. Now I won't get to tend the rabbits. Now he won't let me. He rocked himself back and forth in his sorrow. From outside came the clang of horseshoes on the iron stake and then a little chorus of cries. Lenny got up and brought the puppy back and laid it on the hay and sat down. He stroked the pup again. You wasn't big enough, he said. They told me and told me you wasn't. I didn't know you'd get killed so easy. He worked his fingers on the pup's limp ear. Maybe George won't care, he said. This here goddamn little son of a bitch wasn't nothing to George. Curly's wife came around the end of the last stall. She came very quietly so that Lenny didn't see her. She wore her bright cotton dress and the mules with the red ostrich feathers. Her face was made up and the little sausage curls were all in place. She was quite near to him before Lenny looked up and saw her. In a panic, he shoveled hay over the puppy with his fingers. He looked sullenly up at her. She said, "'What you got there, sonny boy?' Lenny glared at her. "'George says I ain't to have nothing to do with you, talk to you or nothing.' She laughed. "'George giving you orders about everything?' Lenny looked down at the hay. "'Says I can't tend no rabbits if I talk to you or anything,' she said quietly. "'He's scared Curly'll get mad, well.' Curly got his arm in a sling, and if Curly gets tough, you can break his other hand. He didn't put nothing over on me about getting it caught in no machine. But Lenny was not to be drawn. No, sir, I ain't gonna talk to you or nothing. She knelt in the hay beside him. Listen, she said. All the guys got a horseshoe tenement going on. It's only four, about four o'clock. None of them guys is going to leave that tenement. Why can't I talk to you? I never get to talk to nobody. I get awful lonely. Lenny said, Well, I ain't supposed to talk to you or nothing. I get lonely, she said. You can talk to people, but I can't talk to nobody but Curly, else he gets mad. How'd you like not to talk to anybody? Lenny said, Well, I ain't supposed to. George is scared I'll get in trouble. She changed the subject. But what you got covered up there? Then all of Lenny's woe came back on him. Just my pup, he said. Sadly, just my little pup, and he swept the hay from on top of it. Why, he's dead, she cried. He was so little, 
said Lenny. I was just playing with him, and he made like he's going to bite me, and I made like I was going to smack him, and, and I done it, and, and then he was dead. She consoled him. Oh, don't you worry, nun. He was just a mutt. You can get another one easy. The whole country is full of mutts. It, it ain't that so much, Lenny explained miserably. But George ain't going to let me tend no rabbits now. Well, why don't he? Well, he said if I done any more bad things, he ain't gonna let me tend the rabbits. She moved closer to him, and she spoke soothingly. Don't you worry about talking to me. Listen to the guys yell out there. They got four dollars bet in that tenement. None of them ain't gonna leave till it's over. If George sees me talking to you, he'll give me hell, Lenny said cautiously. He told me so. Her face grew angry. What's the matter with me? She cried. Ain't I got a right to talk to nobody? What do they think I am, anyways? You're a nice guy. I don't know why I can't talk to you. I ain't doing no harm to you. Well, George says you'll get us in a mess. How nuts, she said. What kind of harm am I doing to you? Seems like they ain't none of them cares how I gotta live. I tell you, I ain't used to living like this. I could have made something of myself she said darkly. Maybe I will yet. Then her words tumbled out in a passion of communication as though she hurried before her listener could be taken away. I lived right in Salinas, she said. I'm there when I was a kid. Well, a show come through and I met one of the actors. He says I could go with that show, but my old lady wouldn't let me. She says because I was only 15, but the guy says I coulda. If I'd win, I wouldn't be living like this, you bet. Lenny stroked the pup back and forth. Are we gonna have a little place and rabbits? He explained. She went on with her story quickly before she should be interrupted. Well, another time I met a guy and he was in pictures. Went out to the Riverside Dance Palace with him. He says he was gonna put me in the movies. Says I was a natural. Soon as he got back to Hollywood, he was gonna write to me about it. She looked closely at Lenny to see whether she was impressing him. I never got that letter, she said. I always thought my old lady stole it. Well, I wasn't going to stay no place where I couldn't get nowhere or make not something of myself and where they stole your letters. And I asked her if she stole it, too, and she says no. So I married Curly. I met him out to the Riverside Dance Palace that same night. She demanded, Are you listening? M me? Uh, sure. Well, I ain't told this to nobody before. Maybe I oughtn't to. But I don't like Curly. He ain't a nice fella. And because she had confided in him, she moved closer to Lenny and sat beside him. Had it been in the movies and had nice clothes, all them nice clothes like they wear, and I could have sat in them big hotels and had pictures took of me. When they had them previews, I could have went to them and spoke in the radio, and it wouldn't have cost me a cent because I was in the picture. And all them nice clothes like they wear, because this guy says I was a natural. She looked up at Lenny, and she made a small, grand gesture with her arm and hand to show that she could act. Fingers trailed after her leading wrist, and her little finger stuck out grandly from the rest. Lenny sighed deeply. From outside came the clang of a horseshoe on metal and then a chorus of cheers. Somebody made a ringer, said Curly's wife. Now the light was lifting as the sun went down, and the sun streaks climbed up the wall and fell over the feeding racks and over the heads of horses, Lenny said. Uh, maybe if I took this pup out and throwed him away, George would never know, and then I could tend the rabbits without any trouble. Curly's wife said angrily, Don't you think of nothing but rabbits? Well, we're going to have a little place, and he explained patiently. We're going to have a house and a garden and a place for alfalfa, and that alfalfa is for the rabbits, and I'd take a sack and get it all full alfalfa, and then I'd take it to the rabbits, she asked. What makes you so nuts about rabbits? Lenny had to think carefully before he could come to a conclusion. He moved cautiously close to her until he was right against her. Well, I like to pet nice things. Once at a fair, I seen some of them long hair rabbits, and they was nice, you bet. Sometimes I've even pet mice, but not when I could get nothing better. Curly's wife moved away from him a little. I think you're nuts, she said. No, I ain't. Lenny explained earnestly. George says I ain't. I like to pet nice things with my fingers, soft things. She was a little bit reassured. 
Well, who don't? she said. Everybody likes that. I like to feel silk and velvet. Do you like to feel velvet? Lenny chuckled with pleasure. You bet by God, he cried happily. And I had some, too. A lady give me some, and that lady was my own Aunt Clara. She give it right to me, about this big a piece. I wished I had that velvet right now. A frown came over his face. I lost it, he said. I ain't seen it for a long time. Curly's wife laughed at him. You're nuts, she said. But you're kind of nice fella. Just like a big baby. But a person can see kind of what you mean. When I'm doing my hair sometimes, I just sit and stroke it because it's so soft. To show how she did it, she ran her fingers over the top of her head. Some people got kind of coarse hair, she said complacently. Take Curly. His hair is just like wire, but mine is soft and fine. Of course, I brush it a lot. That makes it fine. Here, feel right here. She took Lenny's hand and put it on her head. Feel right around there and see how soft it is. Lenny's big fingers fell to stroking her hair. Well, don't you mess it up, she said. Lenny said, oh, that's nice. He stroked harder. Oh, that's nice. Well, look out now, you'll mess it up. And then she cried angrily. Oh, can you stop it now? You'll mess it all up. She jerked her head sideways and Lenny's fingers closed on her hair and hung on. Let go, she cried. You let go. Lenny was in a panic. His face was contorted. She screamed then and Lenny's other hand closed over her mouth and nose. Oh, please don't, he begged. Oh, please don't do that. George will be mad. She struggled violently under his hands. Her feet battered on the hay and she writhed to be free and from under Lenny's hand came a muffled screaming. Lenny began to cry with fright. Oh, please don't do none of that, he begged. George gonna say I done a bad thing. He ain't gonna let me tend no rabbits. He moved his hand a little and her hoarse cry came out. Then Lenny grew angry. Now don't! He said, I don't want you to yell. You're going to get me in trouble, just like George says you will. Now don't you do that. And she continued to struggle, and her eyes were wild with terror. He shook her then, and he was angry with her. Don't you go yelling, he said. And he shook her, and her body flopped like a fish. And then she was still, for Lenny had broken her neck. He looked down at her and carefully removed his hand from over her mouth, and she lay still. I don't want to hurt you, he said, but George will be mad if you yell. And she didn't answer nor move. He bent closely over her and lifted her arm and let it drop. For a moment, he seemed bewildered, and then he whispered in fright. Oh, I'd done a bad thing. I'd done another bad thing. He pawed up the hay until it partly covered her. From outside the barn came a cry of men and the double clang of shoes on metal. For the first time, Lenny became conscious of the outside. He crouched down in the hay and listened. Not a real bad thing, he said. I shouldn't have bid that. George will be mad, and he said, and hide in the brush till he come. That's what he said. Lenny went back and looked at the dead girl. The puppy lay close to her. Lenny picked it up. I'll throw him away, he said. It's bad enough like it is. He put the pup under his coat and he crept to the barn wall and peered out between the cracks toward the horseshoe game. And then he crept around to the end of the last manger and disappeared. The sun streaks were high on the wall by now and the light was growing soft in the barn. Curly's wife lay on her back and she was half covered with hay. It was very quiet in the barn and the quiet of the afternoon was on the ranch. Even the clang of the pitched shoes... Even the voices of the men in the game seemed to grow more quiet. The air in the barn was dusky in advance of the outside day. A pigeon flew in through the open hay door and circled and flew out again. Around the last stall came a shepherd bitch, lean and long, with heavy hanging dugs. Halfway to the packing box where the puppies were, she caught the dead scent of Curly's wife and the hair arose along her spine. <laughs>